Now, an important class of, of positive definite functions is the quadratic function. A quadratic function is of this form, v of x is equal to x transpose px. And we have seen this guy before. In fact, we saw that we could define an, a norm this way by taking the square root of this quantity. We also saw that this, this form could be used as an inner product. So we have a lot of, we, we already have a bit of mileage associated with this quadratic form. Okay, so one of the nice things about a quadratic form is that it is as simple a positive definite function as we can get. And it's nice because it's differentiable. Okay, so, so it requires that the matrix in the middle here, P, be a positive definite matrix. Now, a matrix is positive, isn't positive definite because you call it P, it's positive definite because of other properties. So in particular, the two important properties is that the matrix is symmetric and eigen, all the eigenvalues are real and positive. Okay. So in the case that the matrix is symmetric, then the eigenvalues are the singular values. So the singular values are in fact the eigenvalues. So the singular values we know for any matrix are real and positive. In addition, a positive definite matrix satisfies these two properties. The determinant of the matrix is positive. The trace of the matrix is positive. We also have that principal minors, that is, subblocks along the diagonal, are also positive definite. And the diagonal elements of P are also positive. So when we have positive definite matrices, we can talk about the um, we can talk about relations between uh, positive definite matrices by looking at, uh, for example, this this type of form. This type of form is, uh, makes sense if and only if the matrix A minus B is a positive definite matrix. Then this makes sense. Okay. okay. Otherwise. Element by element, I may not have every element in this matrix greater than every element in this matrix. Okay, So in fact, this matrix could have negative values in it, and this one only have positive values, and I still get a positive definite matrix coming out. So, But we have this relationship. A minus B is a positive definite. Now, in terms of positive definite matrices, it's very common to want to use partitioned matrices. So partition matrices just means that my matrix is subdivided into smaller matrices. So here, in order for, for this to be a positive definite matrix, I need both Q and R to be symmetric. Notice that I don't need S to be symmetric because I'm having S and its transpose already appearing in here. So we have the relationship that, that P is positive definite is if Q is positive definite and if this quantity is satisfied. Notice I have an inequality here meaning this matrix is greater than this matrix, or R minus this matrix is positive definite. Similarly, if R is positive, so notice that since Q is positive definite here, this inverse automatically exists. Similarly, for R positive definite, this inverse exists, and we have this relationship. So the quantity R minus S transpose Q inverse S is called the Schwer complement of Q, of Q, and Q minus S R inverse S transpose is called the the sure complement of Q of R. So here's an example matrix, and I can go through and show this is positive definite. And so um, I will look at this in more detail in in the practice problems. But here we have some important some important facts. If P is a positive definite matrix, any positive definite matrix and W is a full column rank matrix, then this quantity is a positive definite matrix, W transpose PW. Notice that this is a kind of quadratic form itself. If P is partitioned, again, we have these two properties that are, uh, that are equivalent. So if P is positive definite, if and only if Q is positive definite and the sure complement of Q is positive definite, or R is positive definite and the sure complement of R is positive definite. So where do these guys come from? Well, if we look carefully at this, we can actually factor this matrix. So for example, if R is non-singular, positive definite, we can make this factorization. Notice I have the R inverse appearing throughout here. Why would we want to do a factorization like this? Well, for one reason, each of this matrix itself may be pretty complicated, but these three matrices individually are simple. So this matrix, for example, is 
an upper triangular matrix with ones along the diagonal. Okay, so the determinant of this matrix is not, is one. The inverse is easy to calculate and so forth. Um, this matrix is block diagonal. Okay, that is, I have zeros off the diagonal and then blocks along the diagonal. And then this matrix is just the transpose of this matrix. So, and the reason it's transposed is because remember R inverse is the R is symmetric, so its inverse is symmetric, and so so this this quantity is actually the transposed of this quantity. So that's what happens if R is non-singular. If Q is so th this actually is satisfied for any R non-singular. R does not even have to be positive definite for this to be satisfied. I just need the inverse, and I can verify this that this factorization works just by multiplying through this factorization. Similarly, if Q is non-singular, I can factor it this other way. Okay, so notice this is an upper triangular matrix. This gives me a lower triangular matrix. And, and I have, so notice here I have the R and its sure complement. Here I have Q and its sure complement. And so I, I can do it both ways. And the, the sure complement comes, just pops right out of this factorization. So that's a significant thing. So we're going to be using this concept a lot. It's going to help us simplify a lot. In addition to using that factorization, we can use just a singular value decomposition on P. So a singular value decomposition on P, notice that because it's symmetric, I can actually use the same U on both sides, Okay, where U is a unitary matrix, actually an orthogonal matrix. I can go through and show that the matrix P can be written this way, as the, the singular values times the singular vectors and their transpose. So notice that this matrix, this is a column, this is a row, this is an n by n matrix, and this is basically a sum of n n by n matrices, all each multiplied by a scalar. The matrix S is actually this uh, diagonal matrix, and for a positive definite matrix, all the singular values are strictly positive. Okay, And we generally order them from largest to smallest. So here are the columns of the um, the orthogonal matrix, and this property says that the mat that the columns are orthogonal. That is, this is like an inner product between U i and U j, and what this is saying is U i the inner product of U i and U j is equal to zero if i is not equal to j, and it's equal to one if i is equal to j. That's what this over here is. This delta i j is the Kronecker delta. If i is equal to j, we get one. If i is not equal to j, we get um, we get zero. I can go through and show these quadratic norm bounds that v of x, when, when v is x transpose px, can be bounded below by the singular value times the norm of x, the smallest singular value, and it can be bounded above by the largest singular value uh, times the norm of x. So remember we said that we could obtain a norm uh, from the expression x transpose px if we take the square root. So we actually have a relationship here between these, uh, the, the Euclidean norm and this quantity. Okay, And so we can go through and establish this. And so uh, remember that the range of u is all of Rn. And also for any R, x in Rn, there's a v such that x is equal to uv. That's because of the range. We also have that the fact that the, that the Euclidean norm is unitarily invariant. That is, the norm of this quantity is equal to the norm of this quantity, which is equal to the norm of just this itself. In other words, I can ignore the u in computing the uh, two norm. So uh, the norm of x squared, then, is the sum of the squares of the elements of x, which is equal to the norm of v, which is the sum of the squares of the elements of v. And so I can go through and show that v of x, which is this, so this is x transpose, this is x, and then this is P. And so notice these unitary matrices, since U is, is orthogonal, um, they, they just become the identity matrix. And so it simplifies down to this. This quantity then can be written as this sum. So I can actually write the, uh, the function V of X as a sum of its singular value, the singular values of P times these vectors V. All right. 
So in order to prove this upper bound, we keep track of the fact that this sum, which is v of x, has all the singular values. But all of the singular values, each and every one of them, is less than or equal to the largest singular value. So this sum, this weighted sum, when I have the singular values, is less than or equal to this weighted sum when I only use the largest singular value. And so this quantity here, I can take sigma 1 outside, and the, the resulting sum of the squares of v, v1, uh, vi, is just a v. But the norm of v is equal to the norm of x, and so we have this, we have this inequality. Similarly, for, for this inequality, we keep track of the fact that the sum of the squares of, I'm sorry, the, the singular values are all greater than or equal to the smallest singular value. And so this sum is greater than or equal to this sum. And so, uh, but this sum, again, I can take sigma n outside the summation. The resulting sum of the squares of vi is the norm of vi squared. The norm of v is equal to the norm of x. And so we have this lower bound. Okay, so in this case, I'm not going to provide a proofs video. There aren't many proofs required. So, quadratic functions. So one of the things about the, the quadratic function with partition matrices, it, again, if r is not 0, I can do this factorization. Okay, I can now multiply these two things together and these two things together. Incidentally, this quantity is the, and, and these are transposes of each other. Okay, so multiplying this out, I get this expression. Multiplying this out, I get this expression. And then multiplying all of this out, notice that because of these zeros, I don't have any cross terms. That is, I don't have any x1 times this and so forth because of those zeros. So those zeros actually simplify the structure of the resulting product. And so this overall product then is this times this short complement times just x1 plus this quantity times r times this. But notice that this quantity is the transposed of this, and so we have this expression here. And so notice that this term depends only on x1. This is the only term that depends upon x2. Similarly, if we use the other factorization, that is if q is non-singular, then we have this factorization, and we can boil it down to this, where now this term only depends upon x2, and this term is the only term that depends upon x1. Okay, so, so we have that situation. Now, why would we want to use that? Well, an example of, of this is if I have a quadratic form like this, I can minimize this quadratic function with respect to x2. That is, if I do that factorization, and I so I, I come down to this expression, I notice that I can choose x2 to make this quantity, so this quantity, this tr the transpose of it times r times itself, I can make this 0 by making all of this 0, which gives me a minimum. Okay, And so by making this 0, I get this expression. And so this kind of, this kind of uh, factorization and completing the square is commonly used in optimization multivariable optimization. And so it's really helpful to be able to have this, these kinds of tools available to us. So we've looked at positive definite functions and quadratic functions as a particular case of positive definite functions. We're going to use quadratic functions a lot throughout the rest of the course. So it's helpful to have uh, the good, a good grasp on these things.